Joe Gorman is our digital reporter here at WKBN and just released a five-part web series called Finding Amy Hambrick. Through each part of the series, Joe takes us through the case of local woman Amy Hambrick, who went missing on November 11, 2017. Her remains were found August 26th of this year in a wooded area off the east side off of Thornhill. Joe joins us now to take us through the journey of finding Amy Hambrick. Joe, let's start with what brought you this case to your attention? Well, I have been for years trying to, I wanted to do a story on how homicide detectives do their jobs. And I wanted to join, I wanted to go with them from the time they are called out to the time that the case is, is resolved. Either it's a cold case or it is, uh, or they arrest somebody. Um, so I was embedded with a team of detectives and they called me the day that the remains were found and asked me if I wanted to go out. They said that somebody had found some human remains. And I, I remember saying, are you sure they're human? Because a lot of times they find animal remains, but these were human remains. So I went out and then nobody knew it was her. Uh, so that's how we, um, that's how I got involved with this case. So give me a little bit of the history on this case, talking about Amy uh, when she disappeared and who she was and some of those things. Well, Amy was a 29 year old woman who lived on the west side. She went missing in November 2017. Uh, she was on her way to North Jackson. We don't know if she ever made it or not. Um, the, the family had tried for years. They had uh, had campaigns on social media and, and through traditional media to try and find her. Um, she had a 10 year old, her daughter was 10 at the time that she went missing. Um, and uh, she had been missing for five years before her remains were found. So in your web series, you look at five different parts of the case from the points of view of her family, also law enforcement. Take me through the progression of this series, parts one through five. Okay, well, the first, uh, the first story obviously was when the, the day that the remains were found. Uh, I was called out, it was a Friday night uh, when they called me. So I went out there and I, I tried to tell people about what it was like at the scene, what it was like to, uh, to see the remains and the, the people who were around and the area where they were found. It, it's a wooded area, but it's, it, it's very steep. There's a lot of poison ivy and poison oak, but it's not very far off the road. So, uh, and she was also wrapped up in a claw in a curtain that was bound with duct tape. So that was the first story. The second story was when they uh, opened the curtain in the Mahoney County Coroner's office a couple days later and they pieced the skeleton together and they were able to determine that the remains belonged to a woman. And the anthropologist who put them together was dead on to with the age, she said between 25 and 30. Uh, so. That was the second part. The third part of the story is when the detectives were notified through dental records that the remains belonged to Amy. And then I talked a little bit about how the investigation would go from there. Or, and uh, they would have to revisit a lot of, since they knew it was Amy, they would have to re retrace a lot of their old steps, talk to witnesses, uh, other people who remember Amy and um, to see if they missed anything the first time. The fourth story is when the police announced her to the public that the remains belong to Amy. And I thought that was important to do a story in itself because a lot of times the police do these things so that they could get tips from the public on um, just exactly on what they're looking for. So that was the fourth story. The fifth story, I wanted to do this story last. I, I was thinking of maybe doing it in the middle, but I just thought the timing was better, was I wanted people to know what kind of person Amy was. She was more than just a person whose remains were found. So I talked to her mother, her brother, and her sister, and they, they shared uh, what Amy was like for them. And, uh, and the one thing that they were all unanimous in was her love for her daughter. Did you talk to that family before writing the series or just as part of the series? Too? I talked to them as part of the series. I, I, when I envisioned doing this uh, before I knew who it was, I did want to do, I didn't want to just hang out with the detectives while they investigated a crime. I wanted to make sure that people knew the person who who was the focus of the investigation so that they know what kind of so that they know how this hurts their family and the kind of loss that it is when i found out it was amy i one of the detectives put me in touch with her mother and then um, somebody else put me in touch with her sister and i got in touch with her brother through uh, actually a family member of mine so that's how that all came together and i explained to them what i was doing and I told them about the original intent of the story and how it was Amy that was found and they all agreed to talk to me. All right, we saw some pictures of Amy in that last segment there. There are pictures from this case in each part of the series. What kind of story do they tell here? Well, 
uh, I wanted to tell the story of just, especially in the first two stories, because those are the most visual, but just what the detectives saw when they went out and, um, and found the remains, when they went to catalog the remains and uh, store them and put them together. Uh, one of the things when I envisioned this story originally before I knew that it was Amy was that I wanted people to know what kind of work do detectives do because a lot of times in Youngstown people will say, well, you know, why aren't the homicides solved? Why are there so many open cases? And homicides aren't an easy case to investigate. In fact, they're the hardest of any in law enforcement. So part of that is showing people uh, the best way I can is showing them the things that they see and the things that they have to do. Um, there were some, there were a lot of pictures of Amy and the crime scene and at the morgue that we didn't show because they would just be too graphic and I didn't think people should see things like that. Yeah, in one part of the series you talk about a curtain. I don't know if it's a shower curtain or one that would hang in the living room. Just tell me how that evidence might fit into the story. I'm told it's a, sh uh, it's different people say it's a shower curtain. To me, it looked like a regular curtain. Um, Amy's remains were wrapped up in that curtain and then that curtain was wrapped up itself with duct tape. So somebody took the time to not only wrap her up, but also to tape up uh, the curtain itself, which is a bit unusual in these cases because uh, the police are thinking that this was an overdose. And I've done a lot of these stories in my career. Typically somebody who overdoses, they just want to get rid of the body. They don't care where it's at. They don't put a lot of thought into it. So that's the one thing that puzzles the investigators is there was a bit more thought put into this case. Mm -hmm. But then again, there's no physical evidence to suggest anything else. Is there any way that this case could tie into other cases in the area? Um, I'm not sure. I, I don't, I'm sure the detectives are looking at it, but I don't think so. Um, there's a, unfortunately, there's a lot of these kinds of cases around where, uh, where missing people, um, where people go missing for, it seems like no reason, so um, I'm sure they, they've looked at all of Amy's acquaintances and everything, but uh, as of now, there's just no way to tie it into anything else. Okay, well, Joe, well, thank you for sharing how some of this stuff, this work gets done, this investigative work, and what actually happened in this find me, finding Amy Hamburg case. Thank you. And you can read all five parts of Joe's series, Finding Amy Hamburg, right now on WKBN.com.